everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to our online guests, too. I'm Joanna Lelinkis. I'm the director of the North Carolina Botanical Gardens Education Program. I'd like to thank Tom Keaton for his support of Lunchbox Talks at the Long Leaf level as an event host. And his support helps us support program planning, accessibility, and the reach of these programs. I'd like to introduce our presenter today. Barbara Sullivan is an experienced gardener, author, and a graduate of the NC State Extension Master Gardener Program. She has published two books through the University of North Carolina Press, our partner in this talk today, including Garden Perennials for the Coastal South in 2003, and most recently, what she's here to talk about today, Climate Gardening uh, in the South, for the South, excuse me, published this year. She lives and gardens in Wilmington, North Carolina, and has designed and advised gardens for schools, churches, and private homes, as well as the Minnie Evans Tribute Garden at Early Gardens, also a beautiful garden down in the Wilmington area. So, Barbara, I'm going to share your screen here. Okay. Thank you, Joanna and David, and thank you all for coming out today. This is this is a pleasure to be here. If you all who, who are not here are missing something wonderful because everything's in bloom. There's beautyberry and goldenrod and asters and all sorts of leaves turning. It's such a beautiful uh, uh, place to be giving a talk and I'm looking forward to exploring it a little more when this is over. So get my clicker out here and um, I assume that if you could raise your hands, how many people here are gardeners? Okay, of, of one of one type or another, or or would would like to become gardeners? Okay, great. Um, that's that's wonderful. So, just a little background. I, I won't go into too much detail, but I've been gardening for um, forty years. I live in Wilmington, North Carolina. And the reason I wrote the first book was because there wasn't any information available about the coastal south and what grew well. And so I researched all that. And then I was asked by the University of North Carolina Press to write a book about, well, first they suggested one topic and I said, okay. And the woman said, well, you don't sound very enthusiastic. And I went, said, well, you know, and, she, and then she said, well, I have another idea I've never told anybody about. How about climate change gardening? I said, oh, yes, yes, that is so interesting to me. So she, of course, knew that COVID was going to happen the next year. So it worked out perfectly. She had, she was prescient. <laughs> anyway, I spent my entire COVID period researching this. And so just so you know where I'm coming from, I'm a traditional gardener. I love English gardens. I love, I'm the person who, you know, has tried to create, um, sort of replicate the most beautiful gardens that you see in all the magazines. So that's where I'm coming from. And um, I say that because there are people who have been way ahead of me by 50 years, probably knowing a lot of what I now know. <laughs> Some of you may be in the audience um, that way. But um, so I learned an enormous amount. And what has happened is it has shifted my thinking and that's what I want to share with you. So the other thing I was saying um, to Joanna earlier when I first started this research I'd read books about climate change and if you've read even one book you know you just sort of want to go out and throw yourself off a cliff because it's quite it's quite sobering it's quite discouraging but by the time I'd finished finished researching this I became actually quite positive and quite um, hopeful because um, the message that I'm bringing um, with this book and today is that as gardeners, we can actually make a difference. We, can, we actually have a role to play. We have a role to play as citizens in other ways too. But as gardeners, there are all kinds of specific things we can do to both adapt and to mitigate. So um, let's see. Can you mute your mouse and click on the presentation? Ah, okay. Okay, now let's see. Sorry, we're technical, technical. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So, um, just by gardening, to begin with, we're storing carbon. And so that's huge in climate change. That's the 
one of the number one goals is to get CO2 out of the atmosphere and um, into the ground or to, to, to have uh, engage in practices that create less CO2. So everything we do in the garden, all the choices we make actually matter. Um, and there, I wanna talk about three different ways that we can make a difference. The first is that we can create gardens that are resilient. So they're resilient to the extremes of climate change. While we're doing this, we can help our fellow creatures, which includes pollinators, insects, birds, small mammals, anything else living that's not homo sapiens. Um, and the third thing we can do is stop various harmful practices that we may be engaged in. But in order to do this, we may have to reframe how we look at the garden. That is the experience I had, and I think it's the experience a number of um, traditional gardeners will um, go through as they look at this. So I just created, um, this is a painting I did for one of my grandchildren. I made a, a book and so the ladybug is, not the portrait. And um, <laughs> or she's four months old. I'm sure she would love that portrait of the 16th century Dutch gentleman. But um, my, the idea was to say that for uh, ever since humans have been on earth, which is hundreds of thousands of years, we have naturally, because of the way we're set up, uh, our minds work, we've seen ourselves as the center of everything. And so we felt that plants and animals and nature in general was ours to use and to control and do whatever we wanted with. And that it was sort of, um, um, in, you know, infinite, that, that resources were infinite. And we're realizing now that that is actually not the case. And it's been the same in the garden, I believe. I believe we've always felt that um, the garden was all about us and sort of, um, he just represents, um, he hasn't really done anything terrible, but he represents that idea of um, it's all about us. And I uh, would say that with climate change gardening and the way we need to shift our view is to say that it's, that we are part of a much larger, actually worldwide web, a different kind of worldwide web. Um, yes. I'm not hearing everything. Who was that all that? I have no idea. He's a Dutch gentleman. That's his self-portrait. I just, it looks like Rembrandt, but it's not. It is not Rembrandt. I, he is just a picture that I got on the internet and I could find his name for you, but I had never heard of him before. Um, so he's just standing in for all of us. Um, so, um, yes, okay, so this, are we good? Yeah, that, oh, that one is also on? So sorry, didn't, I did not know that. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is, some, these are some pictures of my own garden at home in Wilmington. And I'd like everybody, if you would, to just do like a few seconds, just sort of, Close your eyes if you want, and just think about why you garden, or if you don't garden, why you would like to garden. Just take a second and think about why you do this. So when I did this thought experiment, um, I realized that I like to play with texture and shape and color, and I try to make things beautiful. And it's sort of also um, a refuge in a way, like a spiritual refuge for me. Um, there can be a lot of reasons. One of the reasons. Um, people have traditionally gardened is, or have one of the goals people have traditionally had in their gardens is to have some kind of control over it one way or the other. So again, visiting gardens in other countries or gardens in this country that are really well controlled, they're very beautiful. I mean, you can't um, deny that they're quite beautiful. It may be that we garden because we love plants and we love to experiment with different kinds of plants and maybe try to make plants work, which really shouldn't work and all that kind of stuff. And that's a whole um, section of the gardening world that loves to do that. And I, of course, have also loved to do that. And of course, lots of people want to grow food and that's a, that's a fantastic reason for gardening. So, <clears throat> So what I want to suggest is that whether it's to keep, oh, sorry, 
whether it's to keep control in the garden or to experiment with new plants or to grow food, whatever the reasons or what other, other reasons you might have come up with because everybody would probably have a different reason. We can do all of that, but we can just look at it differently. We can look at it um, with the idea that we're part of the web of nature. So this is another one of my little dopey drawings, but, and it's sort of at a first grade level, but I think it's important because certainly um, many of us, when we're out there in the gardens, just think of it as being our own backyard or our whatever it is that we're trying to do back there. <laughs> and it's probably unusual to think of it as part of the entire web of nature of um, everything that's growing outside of our garden, all the animals and um, plants that are living outside of our garden. And that's what I want to suggest. So even if you just take one item on this, in this web that I've created here, uh, take insects. Well, caterpillars, for example, 90% of them need one particular specific plant. I mean, they don't all need the same plant, but in other words, they're not generalists. Generalists are insects that can get their um, needs met, whether it's reproduction or food, on a number of different, different sources. But 90% uh, of caterpillars, for example, need a particular specific plant with which they've co-evolved over millions of years. So if that plant is gone, the caterpillar is out of luck. Um, <clears throat> If we look at it even from a selfish point of view with, with our crops or with our crops, 75% of those need insect pollinators. Uh, flowering plants in general, 80% of those need insect pollinators. So it's all connected. And um, birds, for example, 96% of terrestrial birds need caterpillars to feed their young. I mean, these numbers are kind of, to me anyway, very um, amazing and eye-opening. So if one part of this web is harmed, the entire web is gonna suffer and our garden is part of this web. And you'll see, I've created a very lovely picture of soil organisms down there on the bottom, but there's a reason for that. What, what do we got down there in the soil? The soil is unbelievably important. Um, I was very surprised to learn that 80% of a plant's energy goes into developing roots. You would think it would go into flowering or producing seed or something or you know growing tall, but actually it's in the roots. And so this is, I heard something on NPR about three days ago that just blew me away. Um, and I told my husband and he's like, you know, He's not as interested as I am, but in any case, um, one thing that the person said was that a tree, if, if a tree did not have these, so there's something called mycorrhizae that live in the soil. They're a kind of fungus that live in the soil and they coexist with the roots and they help the roots um, get the minerals that they need. And basically they're organisms which suck or take the carbon, the sugar from the plants because they need that. And then they help the plants by saying, okay, you on your own with just roots would be unable to get the minerals you need to grow. And so what this person said was that a tree without mycorrhizae help would get as tall as a tulip. But with the help of mycorrhizae, it can you know, grow into a tree. So mycorrhizae are in one tablespoon of dirt, there are billions of living organisms. So the soil biome, what's in the soil is actually as important or more important than anything else. So we have to keep that in mind as we're dumping things into the soil like chemicals. And um, so um, there are three things that we can do. If we keep all of this in mind, if we keep the web in mind, we can build in resilience, we can help our fellow creatures, and we can stop using harmful practices. So let's look at the first one of these. We're gonna build in resilience in our gardens. We're gonna create gardens that are resilient to climate change. So what's in store for us with climate change? Sea level rise, 
The predictions are for more frequent and more severe storms, droughts, floods, heat waves, and an increase in pests and diseases. So that's the bad news. And what can we do about all this? We can build in resilience. Let's start with heat waves and drought because we've had that this summer. I assume you all had summer like we did. First thing you can do to make your garden resilient to heat waves is to plant in the fall, plant right now. The fall is the very best time of the year to plant because you're gonna have lots of cool weather for these roots to get established. And we've seen how important the roots are. Um, usually there's plenty of rain. And so by the time the plants um, hit, by the time the hot weather hits next year, the plants will be, have much better chance of making it through. If you start, uh, if you plant in the spring, they get hit, they get stressed right away with the heat. So that's number one. Um, create and maintain healthy soil. I've explained why that's important. The healthier the soil, the healthier the plants, the healthier the ecosystem in your garden, and the more resilient it will be to drought. And I'm gonna talk about natives in a second, but this um, botanical garden is a perfect example of why natives are wonderful and why we should plant them. And we'll talk about that in a second, but they, natives are gonna be a go-to plant for, for drought resistance. Um, in the book, I have uh, actually about 23 different charts and tables, and many of them deal with drought resistant trees, shrubs, perennials, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you pick, and they're all natives, if you pick drought resistant plants, you'll have a better chance. Um, Hydrozoning, it basically means that you uh, arrange your garden so that the plants that need watering are grouped together and the plants that don't need watering are grouped together. That's one way to save water during a drought. And if you do all these things, you'll have a better chance of surviving a drought. But what happens if when there has been a drought or there is a drought? There are just several things we can do. First of all, monitor your plants. What they're gonna do is they're gonna go sort of semi-dormant. They're gonna close their stomata um, to try to preserve water. <clears throat> don't, during this time and right after a drought, don't fertilize, don't prune. Um, this will stress them. Uh, once the drought is over, give them water gradually rather than <clears throat> sort of all at once. Um, and, and some symptoms of drought may appear years later. So just be aware of that. Okay, we also want to talk about hurricanes and floods. We have Ian on the way. I haven't checked the news lately, but um, this is a, a reality for us here. Again, there are flood tolerant plants that I've listed in the charts. Um, what happens uh, if depend, depends on how much water and how long the water stays in your garden, but your plants can actually drown. They can be uprooted. They can get covered in silt, which makes it, um, it makes them unable to transpire. Um, so what you wanna do is uh, <clears throat> wash off all the silt after, after uh, the flood and um, choose, oh, sorry. And if you have um, flood prone spots in your garden, you can do a number of things. You can create raised beds, you can uh, install a rain garden. You can create things called bioswales, which lead the water from a high water level to an area that's drier, which will slow the water down. And there are French drains and um, dry wells that also are, you can create in your yard, which will slow the water down and help the water be absorbed rather than flood. And you, if you've done all these things and you're still, um, your yard is still inundated, um, what you wanna do is check all the trees in your yard for stability, especially newly planted ones, and make sure they haven't been uprooted. You wanna cover exposed roots with um, organic material and rinse off silt, or if it's been salt water that's gotten in, you wanna rinse that off. And wait three or four weeks to, if you have injured plants, wait a few weeks and see 
if they are going to survive. Don't just assume that they have uh, died. They're going to go dormant just like during a drought. So don't, right after the flood, don't fertilize and don't prune because you're just stressing the plants when you do that. Just give them a break and let them, sort of like a sick patient, just let them rest is what I would say. Um, wait till the, the ground is dry before you walk on it or dig in it. Okay, so the bottom line with droughts and floods and trying to build a resilient garden is to create a really healthy ecosystem because the healthier the ecosystem, the more it'll be able to withstand all this. So there's a golden rule that's been in existence pre-climate change uh, forever, which is you've got to be careful what plant you choose. So um, I try very hard when I'm, if I'm at a big box store and I'm buying plants, I try so hard to keep my mouth shut because Often the person will be who works there will be telling a customer, "Oh yeah, this will be great," you know, da da da. And I just, just like have to um, walk away because uh, many things that are sold in nurseries and um, garden centers are not appropriate for wherever that nursery or garden center is located. So if you don't get a plant that's appropriate for your climate, you're already uh, sort of giving setting yourself up for problems. And how do we know? Um, and then of course, putting the plant in the right place in your garden. So the, if the plant needs full sun, if the plant needs shade, if it needs more moisture or less moisture, that's critical. And I've tried many times to convince plants that they really didn't need that much sun and you know, just put them over here and you'll be fine. And you're like, no, actually we're, we're gonna die. And so they do. Um, so one thing you can use is the USDA zone map, which I think you're probably all familiar with. And it was created, and I have to read this because I can never say it. it the re they created it many, many years ago, having to do with cold, cold hardiness in the winter is what was the whole purpose of this map. And so it was to reflect the average minimum extreme winter temperatures. That's the official <laughs> wording. Um, so for example, if a plant on, a, on the label says that it's zone four through six, I'm going to call the number four, the first number, I'm gonna call that the winter number. I just made that up. But um, so the winter number in a four through six would be uh, basically it can go down to 30 below if, you're, if you happen to live in zone four. Um, I'm gonna call six the summer number. Okay, so the USDA map was not created to worry about how for the summers and how hot it gets. So that summer number, that second number isn't that reliable because they weren't thinking about how hot it gets in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, or, or other parts of the South, those who are listening from Virginia and other places. Um, so what I um, recommend is that, so this is for Raleigh, um, and Raleigh is, uh, is interesting, it straddles 7B and 8A, but basically what I recommend is to build in some sort of insurance that you um, pick a lower winter number and a higher summer number. So um, you would want the first number to be, yeah, you know, Raleigh is, well, now see, 7B. So the slide got um, mixed up. It's not, it's, Someone else's fault, not mine, even though I created the slide. Okay, what I, what I wanna say, let's just pretend that we live in a zone that is zone eight, this is what I'm trying to say. So what you wanna do is you, your first number should be seven and your last number should be nine. Or it could be less than seven, it could be more than nine, but you wanna, I would not pick a plant, for example, um, this wild geranium where the last number is eight because that means maybe, you know, if, if the summer happens to be hotter than an eight, which it often is, and it will be with climate change because the zones are actually shifting, then your geranium isn't going to make it. I hope that makes sense. This is always weird to explain. Um, not, they haven't, but the most recent readjustment, um, the zones all shifted. When the USDA did it officially, they all shifted. and. And that was, I believe the most recent one was in 2012. Uh, so 
Sorry. They need another ship. They need one. I think they don't want to, depending on, well, we won't go there, but anyway, depending on, you know, what we're particular. Can, can we, maybe we could, if, if you don't mind, I don't want to cut you off, but you may address it I, yeah, I might. And also, I, I always put way too much information here and you all be falling over dead asleep if we, if, if I don't squeeze it all in. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so then, so then what would be a good example? So this, I don't know if you know, fringe tree, it's just gorgeous. It's one of my favorites. Um, and it is zoned three through nine. So it would do fine. You wouldn't have to worry about the summer with fringe tree. So that's, that's what I would go with. Um, that's one way. There also, the EPA has 182 eco regions. If you go on their website, um, you can find out what eco region you're in and that will help you. And also come to places like this wonderful botanical garden and see what grows and see what does well. Um, there are many ways to find out what does well. Another um, tool that we can use is to mimic nature. And this is, um, I'm not sure where this photo was taken, but if you go to the North Carolina mountains, for example, you'll see this is uh, flocks and echinacea and I think some baptisia and these just grow together naturally. So. If you mimic what grows in nature, what things that grow together, they have evolved over millions of years to um, be happy playing together. So that's, that's another um, tool that we have that we can use. <clears throat> so the most important thing that I hope that you'll take away, and I think the fact that you all are listening in today and that you're sitting here is that you're already, I'm sort of preaching to the choir. But um, natives are such, such important um, members of our garden community. And the more natives you can use, the better. And there are many, many reasons for this. They tend to be, many of them are more drought and flood tolerant. They tend to be much more pest-free and disease-free. So you don't need to pamper them. You don't need to add synthetic fertilizers and you don't need to use pesticides. You don't need to use fungicides. And, um, they have evolved to like it here. They actually like it here. So they want to be here. So you have, you just multiply your chances for success when you um, choose natives. And of course, one of the number one reasons is because they will bring benefits to the insects, the pollinators, the birds, all of the creatures that they co-evolved with. Um, there are nativars, which are cultivars of natives. And I, you know, the, there's a big debate about whether you should use native R's, um, but I use native R's in my garden and um, you can research that and see what you think. But of course we know that the pure native um, is always an excellent choice. So um, we've talked about using natives and creating a healthy ecosystem. One of the key philosophies in uh, sort of rewilding natural areas and fighting climate change is the concept of biodiversity. And these are just a few pictures. I'd like to put a few pretty pictures of natives too, because there's so many wonderful ones. But so basically what this means in the garden is that you don't want to limit yourself to just a few species. Even if let's say you're doing all mostly natives, you want to have as much variety as you can, because the more variety, the more insects and other animals you're helping. Also, you're building in insurance or redundancy so that if one species for some reason uh, doesn't make it, you'll have others that will. So um, in addition to trees and shrubs, there are you know wonderful ferns, grasses, ground covers, So building this important, um, building this um, healthy ecosystem is gonna also help us with our second goal, which is helping our fellow creatures. And I don't know if anyone knows what these are. Praying. Is it a praying mantis? Okay, I thought it might be. It's such a great picture. I did not take that picture, but um, no, I, don't, I don't know anything about praying mantises. Oh, okay. So um, 
the reason this is important, okay, we've, we've sort of talked about this, I've talked about this already, which is about um, the need for pollinators for fertilizing our crops, fertilizing flowering plants, and help for the native insects. A, a recent Kew Garden study a couple of years ago uh, suggests that 40% of native plants are at risk for extinction. So 40% of native plants, I know it's discouraging. So this just gives us more reason to um, use our gardens as places where we can help reverse some of this. Um, this is what the, all of our fellow creatures on earth are up against. Plant and animal habitats are being decimated, partly because of the effects of climate change and partly because of human expansion into natural areas. Climate change is leading to early bud break and bud break um, meaning the leafing out of, but of leaves on um, trees and shrubs in the spring. So this early bud break, mostly in the Northeast, it's uh, early and in fact at um, Thoreau's Walden Pond, he had documented bud break for a whole number of species. And so they've gone back, which I thought was really smart and seen what the difference is between then and now. And they found uh, an 18 day difference. And that's a big difference. So for birds and insects that rely on these plants for either reproduction or food, it's, the, the timing is off. They're, you know, um, they're missing out on what they would normally get. And I think the monarch butterfly is sort of the iconic example of this needing milkweed and coming at a time um, when it's not available. So that's part of, part of it. Um, sorry. Mm -hmm. And so insects, birds, and other animals are migrating. They found that they're migrating poleward, meaning so the ones in the Northern hemisphere migrating toward the North Pole and the Southern hemisphere toward the South Pole. And then some are migrating upward sort of to higher elevations, all to find cooler uh, habitats. Plants can't really, of course, migrate, but they can sort of move through seed dispersal. And that's about 18 miles um, a year, which is not enough to keep up. In addition to the bad news, we're going to have a um, a little break in a sec in a sec in a second with a um, picture that will cheer everybody up. But and it, some more bad news is that there are invasive plants, which I'm going to talk about, and those are outcompeting the natives. There are invasive pests, which are also moving um, north in in the northern hemisphere. They're moving north, and basically the whole web is getting disturbed. The whole web that we've talked about that's been in existence for so many millions of years, it's, it's becoming disturbed. I would just like to read really briefly from Doug Tallamy. And uh, if you don't know him, he's a wonderful, he's an entomologist at the University of Delaware um, who goes around the country talking about the need for native plants. And this is what he has to say from his book, Bringing Nature Home. We have taken and modified for our own use between 95 and 97% of all land in the lower 48 states. 53 to 55% has been converted to cities and suburbs. As far as our wildlife are concerned, we have shrunk the continental United States to 1 20th of its original size. This is magnified by the fact that the wild areas are not contiguous, but rather like islands. Unless we modify the places we live, work, and play to meet not only our own needs, but the needs of other species as well, nearly all species of wildlife native to the United States will disappear forever. Because we've already fragmented the continent into habitat islands, we've set the clock ticking for our biodiversity and time is running out. And that is really sobering. Um, so what can we do? Here's some things we can do. Basically, um, our fellow creatures need um, food, shelter, and the ability to reproduce. So what we can do um, is we can plant thickets. And if you don't have a thicket, what you can do, I mean, if, if you don't 
or if you, instead of planting many, many shrubs, you can plant shrubs that are called colonizing shrubs or clonal shrubs. And these are shrubs that spread on their own through either stolons or rhizomes. And so they will create their own thickets. And for example, I have a um, oak leaf hydrangea that has created all sorts of babies and there's gonna be a huge oak leaf hydrangea thicket in, in the back, which is great. So um, one way or the other, thickets provide um, shelter and are very important. You can uh, plant a very biodiverse garden, which we talked about earlier. Also include in your garden, not just fruits and nuts and seeds and berries in the winter, but larval food for caterpillars. So those are all categories to sort of think of as you're choosing your plants. Also, if we plant for four seasons, then um, that will give, and, and in this part of the country, we have the ability to have plants flowering really all year around. So the more variety, the greater variety of flowering plants, um, the more that we're benefiting our fellow creatures. Uh, and an important time that to think about it when we think of, we wanna think about winter and what we're providing for the wildlife for winter, but another important time is when winter is just about over and it's spring is coming, it's warming up and you're just dying to get out there and um, actually usually clean everything up. At least that's how it strikes me. And I am um, embarrassed to say that I did not know this until I was researching the book. And I think probably many of you already knew this, but um, if not, let me tell you that um, I'll, I'll tell you the list here. Butterflies, bees, lacewings, ladybugs, and parasitic wasps, wasps overwinter in leaf litter and the dried stalks of flowers. So they, you know, that's, once you know that fact, then what we should do, or what we should not do, what we should do is wait until the temperature has been 50 degrees or more for seven days. And that's what I did this year. I was very proud of myself, but it was just about killed me because I wanted to get rid of everything. Now, one thing you can do is you can take the dried flower stalks and carefully and put them in a little uh, corner of your yard and that'll give them a chance to emerge. But we wanted to give them a chance to emerge because these are all beneficial insects. Same thing, there are many, many insects that burrow and build their nests in the ground. So during that same period of time, we don't wanna put a lot of mulch because then they won't be able to emerge. So, all right, um, now for a happy, oh, no. Yeah, that was that. Now for a happy face, this is Eloise. She says, I am not worried about any of this. I am fine. I, th I thought we needed a break here. Okay, so, <laughs> and she's deaf now, so she really has no idea what's going on. So the third um, and final shift has to do with harmful practices and what harmful practices are we talking about? These are the four, eliminating toxic chemicals, switching away from gas powered equipment, recognizing learning about invasives and not planting them or taking them out of our garden if we already have them and rethinking the lawn. So let's take these one at a time. I used to have shelves full of all kinds of toxic chemicals. So that's why I think I'm a good person <laughs> to make this presentation um, because I wanted my garden to look a certain way. I thought it shouldn't have certain pests. It shouldn't have weeds, it should blah, 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 blah. So actually this is a really poor, I, I'm happy to say I've gotten rid of them all. Um, took them over to the place where you have to take them to get rid of them. Uh, so we will, uh, if we think of our garden again as a place, if we reframe and we think of it as part of the web of nature, then we do not wanna be poisoning soil organisms we do not want to be poisoning any insects um, or the birds that feed on those insects. And um, systemic chemicals in particular, they're called neonicotinoids. Um, they get into the leaves, the stems, the seeds, the pollen, the fruit, everything. And they have, in Minnesota, they found deer that had neonicotinoids in them. 
So that goes all the way up the food chain. So absolutely do not ever want to um, use those. And of course they've been banned in some places. Um, neonicotinoids, neonics they call them. Um, and some garden centers were using them to um, you know, keep all their plants looking good. Uh, so you just have to be really aware of that and speak up if you see it because it's they're they're really bad. Yes. So the retail places um, are carrying stuff from the growers, so you actually have to trace it back to the grower. The guy has done. I've called okay. them. Okay. So it's not just where you buy them, but actually the growers who they get it from. Property. And and I guess my hope is that. If enough people hear enough information and there's a movement, which I do think there's a trend, I really do, which is, um, I'm kind of a little bit of a poster child for this. I think we're trending away from just wanting to have these perfect gardens that we've made up in our minds for whatever reason to thinking about all these things and how it's all connected. And so I'm hoping at some point that the garden industry will pick up on it. I think they are starting to pick up on it actually from what I can tell. Um, these toxic chemicals can uh, leach into the groundwater and they can end up in our lakes and rivers and streams and kill um, fish and other creatures. They're not necessary. If you've planted a healthy um, ecosystem within your garden, and especially if you're using a lot of nat natives, you really will not need to use these. There are other ways of uh, dealing with problems that you have. Um, I want to recommend something because I don't have time here to talk about it, but spraying the yard for mosquitoes is a really, really, really bad idea. Okay, so here is a, um, a site you could go to. It's it's a um, organization called mygreenmontgomery.org. I believe it's Montgomery County, Maryland, um, and it's the date of the article that I read is March 1st, 2022. I'll say that one more time. MyGreenMontgomery.org, March 1st, 2022. I really, really recommend everybody read that. And I don't think you will ever think it's a good idea to spray your yard for mosquitoes. Um, so weed killers are included in here and that, uh, you know, maybe some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, I don't want this really weedy garden. I want my garden to look nice. I don't want weeds in my garden. So what is a weed? A weed is just a plant that you don't want it to be where it happens to be growing. But the plant is capturing carbon. It's, it's helping to create a healthy soil biome and it's possibly benefiting pollinators and other wildlife. Uh, there are a number of things in weed killers on the other hand, like glyphosate um, kill the soil organisms. They harm nearby plants. They've been linked with uh, human health problems, including cancer. And in some parts, especially in the Northeast, they're just round up and all, they're banned. It's a ban, you can't even use it. So, um, can't, well, buy. Oh, can't, can't, can't buy it, I should say, can't buy it. If you have it, you can use it, you can't buy it. Um, so alternatives are to cover your ground. And, and one of the um, goals of climate friendly gardening is to cover as much of your ground as you can with plants. And so choose the plants that you want instead of the weeds, use native ground covers, uh, allow things like violets and clovers and dandelions and sedge to grow and just enjoy them. And um, there are some, uh, and, and then pull out weeds by hand. This is actually my garden. These, I, don't, I looked up what this kind of weed is. It's everywhere in my garden. You know, pull them up by hand. Um, there are some sort of homemade remedies, salt, vinegar, boiling water. They've been found to kill certain, kill toads and kill other organisms. So I would say before doing that, just do some little research and find out if it really is safe. Okay. Um, integrated, so pests, now we did weeds, pests, integrated pest management has been around forever. Um, basically, it has a number of principles. Choose the right plant, grow plants that do well where you live, and they will be much less susceptible to pests. 
put the plant in the right spot in your garden. If you have diseased plant material, remove it because pests love weak diseased plants. Um, attract beneficial insects to your garden one way or the other. You can actually buy beneficial insects. Monitor so that the infestation doesn't get out of control. Um, assess the damage and understand that some damage is fine. And actually, chewed leaf margins are a sign of success in the garden because it means that you've attracted native insects that are benefiting from your planting. Um, then you identify specifically what the pest is and treat it with the least toxic method. So um, I think a lot of times we've been in the habit of saying there's something and I'm just gonna douse it with malathion and what the heck, you know. So that would be not a good um, option. So just find out exactly what the pest is and use the least toxic. Okay, another dog break. <laughs> this is evidently Doug. This is my friend's dogs in Vermont. Doug spelled D-U-G and Tony. Doug and Tony. <laughs> I like them. All right. What can we do for pests? You can hand pick them. I don't know. This is a banana slug. I actually took this one out in um, Seattle, Washington. But um, you can hand pick them. Use a strong jet of water. You can use row covers for beetles and things. Uh, cardboard collars around plants if you have cutworms. You can use little metal collars if you have slugs and snails. And um, horticultural oil is not toxic to beneficial insects and it will, it will get rid of, um, a little, it'll smother um, scale and aphids. So horticultural oil, sorry, I hope, yeah. And um, Bt, which is Bacillus thera thuringiensis, um, is actually safe. It's safe for beneficial uh, insects. It's, it's a natural um, product and it will kill many, many, many different pests at the larval stage. So while they're caterpillars. So you have to, it has to be applied at the right time. Um, this is all in the book. So I know it's a lot of information. Okay. Um, there are some, the insecticidal soaps that you either make at home or that are commercial have some drawbacks, which again, so I, again, I talk about in the book. Um, one thing really is a bad idea to use are sticky traps. I've seen these advertised on the internet. Sticky traps will trap all kind. It'll, you know, they're um, non-discriminatory traps. They will just trap whatever happens to land on it. And that includes, um, according to what I've read, um, small birds, bats, lizards, snakes, and of course, beneficial insects. So sticky traps are a really bad idea. Okay, we've talked about um, pesticides and herbicides. And what about fertilizers? So um, basically the production, so if you've created a healthy ecosystem with a lot of appropriate plants, including natives, you really will not need to use a synthetic fertilizer. It just won't be necessary. Um, the production of synthetic fertilizers is unbelievably climate unfriendly. It, it produces an enormous amount of CO2 and nitrous oxide, both of which are um, very bad for the environment. A lot of synthetic fertilizer, um, according to the EPA, Americans use way too much, uh, home gardeners, I should say, use way too much. And it ends up leaching again into the ground and going to the groundwater and creating algae blooms and killing fish. Um, it can cause soil acidification and hardening. And it basically, it makes the soil poorer. And we don't want the soil, we want the soil to be very healthy um, for all the reasons we've already talked about. So some um, alternatives, if you create a healthy ecosystem, if you use native plants, um, you can use compost or shredded leaf mulch, which are fantastic to amendments to keep the soil healthy. I'll just list a few things that are good to use instead of synthetic. Fish emulsion, liquid kelp, compost tea, worm castings, bone meal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so am I, am I, oh, five minutes for me. Okay, I'm getting the five minute warning. All right, so let me um, move on to gas 
powered equipment. And I just want to say that um, two days ago, I finally got up the courage to phone these people who've been coming to our house and they've been basically blowing leaves. I do all the gardening myself, but they blow leaves and we have a tiny little lawn and they, um, they mow the lawn, but they use gas powered equipment. And I finally just phoned and said, you know, this is, you all have done a great job and it's not personal, but we're going to stop. So that was kind of, for me, that was a milestone. So gas powered equipment, if you read, um, what it says that the EPA estimates that using a gas powered lawnmower for one hour is equivalent to driving a car 200 miles, right? So it's, it's when you learn this information, you can't unlearn it. It's like not being able to unsee something. So uh, you can use, you know, hand, hand mower, hand tools. And um, let me move on because I only have a little bit of time and just talk about, in, and the lawn is a completely different, topic, which I probably don't have time for, but lawns are not healthy for a climate-friendly garden. They're monocultures. Um, they don't give any benefit to pollinators and you, uh, people end up using chemicals on them. So um, again, there's a chapter on that in there. Let me just um, finish some of, and this is these, what the lawn chemicals kill. So just take a look at that. And and let me just really quickly finish. Yeah, do you love that? It's yeah. like it's like some kind of monster out of a fairy story, kudzu, which was brought in by the uh, from Japan by people thinking it would be such a great plant to add to the American uh, gardening scene. So there seems to be a lot of confusion with just about every time I've talked to people. Some people think of invasives as I've got a garden and there's this thing that's driving me crazy because it's invading the other parts of my garden. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about invasives which escape from the garden. And I've never been able to um, wrap my brain about this until recently, because I'm like, nothing is escaping from my garden. My garden's not going anywhere. But basically what's happening is either through seeds blowing or birds, for example, eating a Nandina berry and then pooping it 20 miles away into a natural undisturbed wilderness area is what happens. And so I'm talking about invasives which land, they sh they're, they're not native, they land in a wilderness or a natural area, they outcompete all the natives, they make a much poorer ecosystem when all is said and done, so that provides much less support for all the insects and other animals, birds, um, they um, don't have any in natural enemies, so you would say to yourself, well, certainly the nurseries and big box stores would never sell invasives, bad news, yes they would, so um, we need to, let's see if I can give you um, really quickly, some examples that might shock you or might not. I, some of them shocked me, butterfly bush, popcorn tree, English ivy, privet or ligustrum, princess tree, tree of heaven, mimosa, miscanthus grass, nandina, Bradford pear, and there's 70 others. So yeah. And I have a, actually a list I can show people here. If you go to the North Carolina Invasive Plants Council, you will see native. lot native plants council. I'm sorry, invasive plants council, excuse me. Um, you will see who all the bad boys are and it, you would, I think, be shocked. Um, I, again, um, writing this book, I ended up pulling out two absolutely gorgeous Nantina, Nandinas that I love to death and and then I thought, well, I'll give them to somebody. And it's like, well, no, that would, that would really be terrible. Anyway, so I got rid of them. All right. So I think the rest of this is just happy slides to look at that are um, native. And just to say that we can do, we can create very, very, very beautiful gardens with natives. Um, we can make gorgeous, gorgeous places. And... I think to conclude, we can make a difference because if we change, even if everyone who happened to be listening to this made one choice, one change, which is how I think we should start bit by bit, um, that would make a difference. And if uh, people, if gardeners in general, just start seeing the garden differently, it will, it will change and we will, we will really um, be 
helping to mitigate climate change, which is, which is unfortunately with us. So um, thank you all very much for listening to so much information. And um, I appreciate your being here and uh, thank you again. And if, I guess we'll have questions. Barbara, thank you so much. Sure. And I think it's really powerful the way you shared climate change gardening from your journey uh, in gardening and, and the changes you're making uh, from what you learned. So thank you for that. And the book, which we have in our bookshop, our garden shop, and we have some for sale, and Barbara will be signing it afterwards, uh, is wonderful and goes into much more detail on soil and uh, staying away from synthetic uh, Fertilizers and chemicals and wonderful lists of plants in the back. So uh, we look yeah. forward to you all engaging and reading the whole book if you haven't already. So uh, we'll take one moment to see if there's uh, maybe one question before we close out. The, the literature is now saying, uh, particularly for the East Coast, the night temperatures in the summer are the biggest change, and growing tomatoes is now quite difficult. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Night temperatures make a huge difference. And for example, in the south, because plants need cooling off period at night, many plants, not all plants, but most plants, and um, otherwise they're just fighting against, you know, they're, they're, they're not getting what they need. And so they're stressed. And um, another thing in the south is that um, many plants are not getting the cooling temperatures they need during the winter because the winters are not as not in, enough cooling days and so a lot of plants are waiting they're like oh i will i will there will be bud break you know or i will initiate bud break when i've had x number of days of cooling and they're waiting and waiting it's like uh and and those days don't come um some plants that don't need the cooling break their buds earlier um, because the warmer weather comes earlier and then there's a danger of frost, of a late frost. So. Well, we are at time and uh, any questions that came in through Zoom, maybe we'll pass them by you. Uh, sure. And uh, send those out and follow up okay. for the registration list. All and right. Please join me in thanking Barbara again and please join her if you have other questions. Thank you.